Hello everyone, let's get into some commentary. I wanted to wrap up a few thoughts about chapter 6 and then we'll talk about chapter 7, which you will have just uh, read. Um, and this is the first thing about chapter 6 is really going to carry over into chapter 7, but it's just this um, kind of hit and miss nature of Joseph Smith's miracle working. Um, chapter 6 uh, talks about how Newell Knight uh, is uh, having these seizures, and I think that Joseph Smith exercising the demons out of Newell Knight is real in the sense that his prophetic bearing and the words he used in the context in which they were used provided for Newell Knight a powerful cognitive series of events that allowed him to release himself from the bondage he put himself in because uh, if you'll remember from chapter 6 Newell Knight had a very similar experience to Joseph Smith with the first vision but whereas Joseph Smith overcame Satan as the pillar of light descended and he saw God the Father and his son Jesus Christ Newell Knight goes out to pray and he comes back having been basically drawn driven crazy by satan um he's so caught up in his sins and so joseph smith comes in and um exercises this demon and so i think that's very real i think uh what i think is happening is an instance of kind of a placebo effect these people around joseph smith are attracted to him he's appealing He's handsome, he's, um, he's eloquent in a way that is meaningful to the ag agrarian humbleness, humility of this area. Um, it's, it's not grandstanding necessarily, it's not Oxford um, PhD level dissertations, it's a, a strong believer in God on the American frontier that people believe is a prophet. And so I'm willing to take some of these people at their word that um, he did cause miraculous healings to occur. But as we'll get into as we discuss chapter 7, it wasn't always, um, you know, his track record isn't uh, super spotless. Um, I do want to say uh, about this and chapter 7 as well as anything else, I think I mentioned in the introduction to the book, um, just be aware that this book was written in the 1940s and the second edition in the 1970s and so the way that Fawn Brody talks about uh, indigenous people in the United States uh, the terms they use you know calling them red people things like that that is not societally acceptable um, and so I am reading it um, but just be aware that that is that is outdated language and and, and some of them are quotes from the 19th century but but even some some of that language creeps into Fawn Brody's own writing so I figured I'd just put that disclaimer in there that be aware that there's language in there that may be sensitive to some years um, okay I think there was a, one or two other things I wanted to say about chapter 6 um, Maybe not. Um, ah, I wanted to talk about the city of Enoch. Um, so Joseph Smith has this revelation about Moses basically having this revelation where he's talking face to face with God, or if not face to face, you know, through the burning bush, he, he's, he, he's having this powerful revelation given unto him in which, uh, it is referenced the city of Zion, the city of holiness, which was such a model of civic goodness that the Lord had transported it intact to heaven to be his personal dwelling place forever. Now, you have to think of, like, can we build that? I mean, this is basically talking about utopia. This is a theocratic utopia in which everyone is obeying the same commandments given by God. Um... But even in that way, when has the world ever looked like this? Um, what would the city of Zion look like? And would we want to build it today? My suspicion is no, you wouldn't want to because 
I just can't. I've never been in any sort of world at, at a societal level. I've never lived in a city where there weren't people bickering. Uh, the United States right now is in a period of unprecedented political polarization, worse than ever before. Um, you know, if if you don't have my political persuasion and ideology, then you are the scum of the earth, and you deserve to be put in prison or or mocked ruthlessly, and so uh, you know, so on and so forth. And so, as I was reading about this city of Zion, which is raised into the sky, I'm I'm trying to think, and I just can't wrap my head around what that city would look like. But I venture to guess that Joseph Smith's idea of a city that is this perfect it looks a lot different than the type of uh, world that I would consider a quasi utopia. Um, hmm, yeah, just really interesting. Uh. I love how Joseph just tells his people, hey, we're going to Kirtland, we're going to move 300 miles west to Ohio, and uh, <laughs> he says, using the mouthpiece of the Lord, um, they that have farms that cannot be sold, let them be left or rented as seemeth them good. So this is a part of the or origin of Mormonism where people are starting to significantly sacrifice for the Lord and for the prophet Joseph Smith, etc. Um, these people are all in. If you are willing to not even... Can you imagine, like, uh, you own a house? Uh, well, <laughs> I was born in 1995, so I will probably never own a house. But just bear with me, for if you will. Can you imagine uh, having owning a piece of property, and then you just leave, and you don't tell anyone, you don't you know you don't try to sell the property you don't try to clean it up or anything that's crazy you got to be super all in this is not like a um hey will you like my sister-in-law's cake business on facebook it's like that's one level of support but selling your pro like not even selling but leaving your property to go 300 miles to a place you've never been because a prophet said the lord told you to do it these people are in Okay, on to chapter 7. So this is where we arrive in Kirtland. A lot of the chapter talks about the uh, 19th century um, communal societies that were popping up. It, it was mentioned that I think Ralph Waldo Emerson wrote to somebody that basically everyone in their, everyone had an idea about setting up a commune. Biblical communism this idea that all things are had in common. There's this funny moment uh, in the early days of Sidney Rigdon's Congregation of Communism where they, it was just disintegrating because people were saying, oh, this uh, tractor that you have? Yeah, well, all things are in common, right? I think it's mine now, sort of a thing. Uh, no leadership, no administration. Um, I think it's fair to say that if you want to do communism, you better darn well have someone that's good at logistics because this chapter proves that uh, with no uh, centrified leadership um, it is just chaos to try to do that but it is cool to learn about this piece of American history it's not something you learn in the history books but there surely were um, the new harmony and and these other communities that were sweeping across the land and making big news um, I thought it was interesting that Joseph sets up the church and he's got this um, uh, idea that everyone can be priest. It's like, kind of like Oprah. You get to be a deacon. You get to be a deacon. You get to be a priest. Look under your chairs. There's a priesthood ordination for you. That is, that's kind of like a big strength of the church, but also one of its big weaknesses. We talked about in chapter 6 how Joseph Smith had to kind of put his foot down um, on these other people that were having revelations. And they go, well, hold on. If the gospel is being restored, how come you're the only person that gets to have revelations? But it just so happens when you can say, thus saith the Lord, uh, the debate seems to kind of peter out from there. So, you know, no one's having their own revelations anymore. And everyone is giving the priesthood. So you've got this situation where... Um, everyone, it's kind of like syndrome from the Incredibles, like when everyone has the priesthood, 
No one has the priesthood. Um, and Fawn Brody, I thought this was hilarious. Fawn Brody in the 1940s says that Joseph's clerg- clergy was thus entirely composed of laymen. Moreover, of practically all the laymen in his church, the result was a pyramidal church structure. Oh, man, if you've never lived in Utah, I live in a part of Utah that is right by a lot of the headquarters for many of the the United States' largest corporations of pyramid schemes. Um, MLMs, multi-level marketing, as it's, it's not a pyramid scheme. Uh, many of you listening may have had um, a friend on Facebook from high school reach out, hey, haven't heard from you. Hey, just so happens I have a business opportunity. Uh, many people have pointed out that the structure of the LDS church is uh, remarkably similar to a multi-level marketing pyramid scheme, and I just thought it was really funny that those exact, the pyramidal church structure in Fawn Brody's own word, words makes it into here. I mentioned, I think, in the commentary for chapter 5 that I was uh, starting to feel a little restless in terms of wanting Fawn Brody to kind of dig in and and give Joseph Smith uh, harder scrutiny, but I think as we got into chapter 6 and now in chapter 7 as we hear more about some of his failures and some of his leadership challenges, um, it's it's clear that Fawn Brody's um, level-headedness has paid off because instead of her digging in and dunking on Joseph Smith and the origins of Mormon Um, I think by this point we're starting to see the primary documents and and narrative about it kind of speak for itself Um, and so for those listening that do not like Joseph Smith do not think that he was a good person or you know have come to the conclusion that he is perhaps not what you were taught in Sunday school um, these chapters are where it's starting to get really fun because Uh, you can kind of feel that there's a bit of schadenfreude when he fails to heal someone miraculously or or says things that cannot be proven true and and has kind of left him disgraced. Um, So if you're into that, if if that's something that um, you enjoy, well, then I think this chapter is the first of many which will give you that satisfaction. Um... So on my mission, there was this huge idea about leadership. You, there, in the, for those of you who don't know, you may have seen the Mormon missionaries with the white shirts and iconic black name tags. There's a leadership structure. and The, the Mormon missionary uh, experience is, is largely designed to give young men and women leadership opportunities um, so that when they get off their mission, they can be uh, productive members of society and, and also get the leadership experience they need to start serving in the church. Um, and so in the mission, you've got companionships, districts, zones, and then uh, and that's kind of the main, there's this uh, organizational structure similar to like a corporation with uh, man- supervisors, managers, and regional directors and things like that. And so, but keep in mind, these missionaries are 18 to 30 year old people who, uh, many of which literally graduated high school a, ye- uh, a week ago. In, in the case of that, I, I met missionaries, I worked with missionaries on my mission that had literally, the last week before I met them, had been on the podium receiving their high school diploma. So I, I remember being, um, enthralled and and wanting to be a leader uh, so bad because there was this idea that being a leader meant God trusted you and that you were endowed with spiritual strength. So uh, the the highest, most coveted leadership position amongst the missionaries was the assistant to the president. The mission president um, is an adult church leader who uh, quits their job and and moves to wherever the mission is and presides over the affairs of that mission for two to three years. And so the assistance of the president are a missionary companionship that is basically the absolute cream of the crop, the uh, valedictorians of missionaries that get to serve with the president. So if you are in the hunt for leadership opportunities, you're kind of hoping to be the next assistant. And this was a game that I got thrown into. Um, I desperately wanted to prove myself. What can I do? What can I say? Who can I um, 
you know, there's, it's so very political. You've got these zone conferences where missionaries get together and um, kind of hobnob and, and take lessons with each other. And, and uh, it's kind of like a continuing education sort of thing. And uh, so you're you're trying to brown nose. I played this game. I never did get to be an assistant to the president, but I did serve as a zone leader for a good portion of my mission. Um, and so why do I talk about this? Why am I going on this tangent? Well, in the early days of the Mormon church, uh, the Mormon church is different than other Protestant churches and, and the Catholic church because uh, basically no one gets paid, at least at the local level. At the Central Salt Lake headquarters for the Brighamite sect of Mormonism, you know, like the Utah Mormons, um, the people at the highest level of leadership, the First Presidency, the Apostles, and the Quorum of the Seventy, um, those people are being paid. And if I understand correctly, they are being paid in the top 10% or higher salaries in the United States, and their salaries are not taxable because they belong to a church that does not pay taxes. So they're making bank. Um, Again, pyramid structure. The people at the top are making hundreds of thousands of dollars. um, And then the local leadership, the, the people you see at church on Sunday, all those leaders are not paid for their work. So I always thought, you know, if these people, the the thing that people will say in the church is, well, these people aren't paid. So there's really no, um, you know, we're all just humble servants of the Lord. This is a grand deception. This is a huge lie. There is an immense level of of prestige that is granted to these priesthood leadership opportunities and uh, the misogyny of women not being able to be ordained to the priesthood is an issue that um, has led to the excommunication of many prominent dissidents in the 21st century so this is still a problem today but uh, von brody says that you know we've got all these new testament deacon teacher priest elder 70 year bishop all these titles Each title carried a certain rank, progression from lower to higher being dependent upon a man's faith, his zeal for the church, and the good will of his superiors in the hierarchy. So make no mistake, being paid or not, there is an absolute societal ladder in which people who prove themselves to be trustworthy and faithful servants of the Lord, and keep in mind that we know from the Doctrine and Covenants that whether the Lord says it or Joseph Smith says it, it's the same thing. It does not matter. If Joseph Smith says something, it is pretty much as if the Lord himself had said it. And so you've got all these people that have moved to Kirtland. They're setting up this communistic society. And everyone is, you know, being a deacon is not enough. You want to be a teacher. You want to be a priest. I'm not sure exactly if the leadership structure is the same as it is today, but you get what I'm saying. So you've got me on my mission wanting desperately to prove myself, not because I was going to get paid, not for nothing else other than the being recognized amongst my peers as being um, a role model and and things like that this is uh this culture is huge in the church if you've got a if you're a bishop then you're basically a bishop for life as soon as you stop being serving as a bishop in an active capacity people will still call you bishop you'll be seen as someone who served as a bishop etc and even more so if you're a patriarch, if you're a stake president, if you're a temple president, these people are not being paid for those endeavors, but they are more than being compensated for the societal prestige. And that may not be as big of a deal in a place like Omaha, Nebraska, my hometown, where there's only a handful of stakes, but in Utah where the or, or Idaho or Arizona, these places with massive LDS demographics, uh, where the entire city council is made up of church members, uh, you better believe that there is a social hierarchy attached to these sort of things. And that comes from this tradition of the lay clergy in Kirtland and Joseph Smith wanting everyone to be in this pyramid scheme. Uh, so that was interesting. Um, I think this, uh, moving on, this story of Joseph Smith um you know, the guy says, hey, you should prove to me that you're a prophet. What's your evidence? And then Joseph Smith, uh, lightning quick 
witty response says, oh yeah, do you want me to paralyze you? Do you want me to wither your arm? Do you want me to turn your tongue dumb so that you can't speak? Um, man, that is brilliant. I know that there's a lot of stuff to dislike about Joseph Smith, but I think this is one tiny example that shows just how charming he was. He was even if he was not perhaps PhD dissertation level educated, um, you better believe this guy had a silver tongue. This guy could talk himself out of anything. And um, you kind of can't help. I, I have a feeling that this is the kind of person that if you saw today, you may hate, you may scoff, etc. But you would you would be forced to admit the, the charisma that is oozing from this this person. I think that's fair to say. Um, I don't want to talk too much about the, the whole communism thing. It, it clearly did not work. I do think it's worth mentioning how funny it is that so the, the modern 21st century conception of Mormonism culturally is, is extremely um, right-wing, conservative, Fox News, Bill O'Reilly, uh, Sean Hannity, uh, Tucker Carlson, all these people, you know, the January 6th uh, insurrection on the United States Capitol, uh, failed insurrection, I might gloat, um, there were, for, for being like 1% of the, the United States population, there was an abundance of Mormon activity there. There was the guy that was cosplaying, dressed up as a character from the Book of Mormon. Um, there were signs talking about quoting Book of Mormon scripture. Um, indicting the United States government. Uh, there were, I saw pictures of people wearing BYU, like storming the Capitol wearing Cougar merch. Um, the Bundys, you know, that they, there are high profile Mormons in the Congress chambers climbing on the, the rafters and stuff like that. So, um, Mormonism has this idea of it being super conservative and yet um you know, this communism that is so anathema to their worldview is is something that joseph smith sidney rigdon and the early saints in kirtland were completely involved in um i feel so bad for oliver cowdery because he has to go serve this mission with the indigenous people and he is just an abject failure cannot get anything going you know no crap, right? Like, of course that wasn't going to work. Why would it? And as soon as the... It, it, it says, if we're to believe the accounts, that they were having success, and then the other preachers showed up, and they're the ones that foiled it for everyone. And, there's, you know, where there's smoke, there's fire. There's probably some truth to that. Um, if, you're in the, if you're in the race to save people's souls, having another preacher from a different religion do better than you... Um, you know, there's, I could see why that would be a problem for you if you're that preacher that's having to deal with the truth going forward. Um, but, just, you know, and then he, so he comes back, Oliver Cowdery, from his mission and says, basically, I didn't do anything successful. We failed. So he goes and uh, goes back to serve as a missionary among the uh, European settlers and he writes, um, we dwell in the midst of scorpions, and in Jesus we trust. Um, man, going back to my mission again, sorry for uh, waxing poetic about my, my two-year mission. But, um, God, yeah, there were so many... I mean, my mission sucked. But, like, if you're listening to this and you served a mission, then you know. Even, like, there are people that say it was great. And that's awesome, I'm glad. But for many of us, it was really horrible. And uh, I just really feel for, in a way that if you haven't served a mission, you wouldn't be able to empathize. I totally get where Oliver Cowdery's coming from. And um, <laughs> I'm triggered. I Yeah, it sucks. It sucks to go tell people the truth and have them not even, it's not even that they don't believe it. They don't even pay attention. They won't even give you the time of day. Rightfully so, I, from my point of view now. Um, this, okay, so I was mentioning earlier how it's kind of, there's some schadenfreude, some happiness, and 
satisfaction derived from watching Joseph Smith fail to heal people. But Fawn Brody is so amazing, so intelligent. She brings up this great point that um, for all these people that he was able to exercise demons from or tell them to rise and walk, Joseph Smith was absolutely helpless to help his wife. She lost so many children in childbirth and was just suffering in silence. And um, that's one of those things where um, I'm sure Joseph Smith was taking that to bed because he may have convinced himself that the Book of Mormon was true despite the artifice that went into its creation. He may have convinced himself that he did in fact see a vision. We talked about in uh, one of the earlier chapters about how whatever was a dream was a vision became reality for Joseph Smith. So let's, let's grant him that he is so sincere even in trying to heal these people in his community that are looking to him as a prophet and spiritual leader, um, he is the one family he cannot use his prophetic power to heal is his own. And I think we're gonna hear, we're gonna see a lot more of that as the book. So that's a, that's kind of a somber moment, but um, you know, just think of the pain that. Emma Smith went through. I think this book is overwhelmingly fair towards Emma. Um, there are a lot of members of the church that see her as kind of a, a a thorn in Joseph's side, kind of sometimes getting in his way. And um, and there's the people who will go, hold on, hold on. The Doctrine and Covenant says Emma is an elect lady. I think it should be abundantly clear that for that one phrase saying that God likes Emma Smith, there's so many where Joseph is basically like, hey, Emma, uh, I am God. And if you don't listen to what your husband says, you will be destroyed. And I, I personally take issue with that. I'm sure there are apologetics saying why Joseph Smith was actually empowering women the whole time. Um, I'm personally not interested in that. But if you are, I'm, I'm very, if you are, uh, I can't imagine you would still be listening to this by now. Um, so anyways, that's the serious part. Let's get to the fun part. Um, <laughs> so he, Joseph Smith is kind of on a manic episode. So he's running around. They've got this conference going and, and he, he goes, Brother Murdoch, I command you in the name of Jesus Christ to straighten your hand. This is very televangelist. Um, this is like the people who tried to, um, was it Kenneth Copeland that like blew wind into the microphone to rebuke COVID? This stuff, you can look this stuff up on YouTube. So Joseph Smith says, straighten your hand. And this guy's hand isn't moving at all. Um, <laughs> and then there's this, the family, oh yeah, so the, the next one is the, there's an old man who's limping, and he says, I, you know, basically rise up and walk, and he takes two steps and collapses, and, and then there's another family that brings, kind of like in the New Testament, hey, you know, we refuse to bury this child because this conference has brought us all together, and, and if, if there were ever a time that the Lord in his mercy was going to bring a miracle through the prophet, it would be now, and Joseph Smith is helpless, um, and, and his normal tactic of, well, you just don't have enough faith, can't work, because these people are the last people to give up faith, everyone else kind of had said, okay, let's go home, and these people are still on their knees begging and pleading, so Joseph Smith can't rebuke them for not having faith, and so what is there to do? Um, and this is the first, Fawn Brody points out, this is the first moment in Joseph Smith's life um, that is like a true objective failure. There is no apologetics for it. He told people, within three days, some of you here will see, the fa see Jesus face to face. Um, I don't really like how evangelical people try to use Christianity to disprove the Book of Mormon or, or the origins of Mormonism because there's absolutely just as much ridiculous stuff about Christianity that is, to everyone else, um, is just as crazy as anything in Mormonism, but they'll go, oh, no, 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 Mormonism's crazy, but Christianity makes so much sense. <laughs> yeah, I don't think so, at least not in my opinion. I don't even know why I said that, but that's about it for uh, chapter seven. Um, a really good chapter. Uh, the next chapter, I think we're going to be talking about the pr uh, process of 
building temples. The early uh, Latter-day Saints are known for their worship in temples, and so we're going to get a little bit more into that. That's all for now, and uh, see you for chapter 8.